Hey, welcome back to calculus. In this second section of chapter four, we're gonna be looking at a result called the mean value theorem. And it in turn uh, will play a, a significant role for us in the future. It's gonna be the kind of underlying mathematical fact for some of our, our work that we do in optimization. All right, so you can see our objectives there. Let's just walk through them as usual. I wanna, I wanna state there's actually two theorems, Rolle's theorem and the mean value theorem. Rolle's theorem is kind of a special case of the mean value theorem. I'm gonna ask you to talk about why in your reflection. Uh, I, I want to be able to interpret these things geometrically. They both have very nice uh, geometric interpretations about the graphs of functions. Uh, both theorems guarantee certain values that do something. I want to show you how to find these values. And then we'll look at two of the consequences of the mean value theorem here in this lecture. Uh, we already know that the derivative of every constant function is zero. The mean value theorem tells us that those are the only functions that can do that. Any function whose derivative is identically zero has to be a constant. And as a consequence of that, that any two functions that have the same derivative uh, are, differ by a constant, that their graphs are just vertical shifts of each other. Okay, so that's the outline. Let's just get going. I've got uh, the statement of Rolle's theorem here first, together with some pictures to kind of help us understand it. Uh, uh, theorems have hypotheses and conclusions, things that you're assuming and things they guarantee. Rolle's theorem has three hypotheses. Uh, let's just kind of walk through them, the technical terms, remind ourselves of what we mean. So the first one is that we have to have a continuous function on a closed interval, all right? So continuous meaning no gaps, no holes, no vertical asymptotes, right? The limit exists at every point. At the endpoints A and B, they would be uh, right-hand limits and left-hand limits, respectively, and they equal the function value. So you have to have a nice continuous function. It has to be differentiable, at least on the open interval. So the tangent line exists at every value of between A and B, excluding possibly at A and B themselves. So, so no cusps, no vertical tangent lines. And then the third hypothesis is that the function's output values, the Y coordinates at the endpoints A and B are equal. All right, so you can see in the four pictures that are drawn below down there that those hypotheses are all satisfied. In every one of these four pictures, you've got a continuous function. Uh, and if you look at its values at the two endpoints, they're always the same. Yeah, the y values at these endpoints are equal. This function has only one y value on the entire graph. Uh, they're continuous, there's no gaps, no jump discontinuities, and they're differentiable. They have nice smooth tangent lines. So what does Rolle's theorem guarantee? It says that there has to be at least one number, there may be more than one, but there has to be at least one number between a and b where the derivative is zero. Okay, so that's what the conclusion of Rolle's theorem is, that you have a continuous function that's differentiable on an open interval, the values at the endpoints are the same, f of a is equal to f of b, the derivative has to be zero somewhere between. So you can see that's the case in these, in these pictures. The author's showing us for this first function, the constant function, the derivative is zero everywhere. And you pick any value of c you like between a and b and the conclusion is satisfied. Uh, uh, here, this function, it looks like there's one value of c in, in, in the figure b. In figure C, it looks like there's two values of C where the derivative is zero. So the author is drawing the usual little, you know, piece of a tangent line that's horizontal. So hopefully that's a convincing image that the derivative is zero there. In this last image, or example D over here, there's just one value of C. But in all cases, in Rolle's theorem, you should actually try to do this. Stop the video right now. Draw a function that satisfies these hypotheses. So, so pick a spot on the y-axis, that's all you have to do. Uh, uh, pick a spot on the y-axis, make your function value the equal at a and b, and then starting at, at a comma f of a, draw a continuous differentiable function. I'll just draw one here as I'm speaking. It can wiggle, it can do a lot of stuff, but it's gotta be continuous and it's gotta end up at b. You cannot avoid having places where the derivative is zero. Yeah, so hopefully you'll stop it, try to draw your own. Try to, maybe just by drawing it, you can kind of see. We won't bog ourselves down too much in the proof of this, but I do wanna say something because it uses some of our, of our results that we've just uh, established in the past. So we prove it by cases. Uh, I'm gonna just say, look at the kind of th three cases real quickly here with you. Uh, the first case is that if f is a constant function, yeah, that's like the picture on the far left over here. If f is a constant function, well, then its derivative is zero for every x. So you can pick c to be any number between a and b that you like. So that's kind of an easy case. In a, in a second case, suppose that um, there's some x in between a and b uh, such that its y value is bigger than f of a. Yeah, that would be like uh, uh, this picture or the c. 
there's some place in between a and b where f of x is bigger than f of a all right well then the extreme value theorem because we know that f is a continuous function it has to have a maximum value uh, and if there's some x that's bigger than f of a f of a can't be that maximum value yeah, that's the whole point. So, so there has to be some other maximum value, some C that would be between A and B uh, uh, that gives a maximum, right? Because uh, remember, uh, F of A is equal to F of B. So this, this, this F of X is bigger than them both. So the maximum has to incur, occur in between A and B strictly. And we've seen before, we called it Fermat's theorem, that the derivative is zero at a maximum, right? So Rolle's theorem is kind of true because there there has to be a maximum value in this case and at a maximum value the derivative is zero so i just highlighted in blue the two kind of theorems that i'm using the extreme value theorem says the maximum has to be there uh, i know it's not f of a uh, fermat's theorem says that the derivative has to be zero there the third case i'm not going to go through the details it's just that you know it there, there if there's some x that's smaller than f of a and f of b okay well then the extreme value theorem says there's a minimum uh, and at that minimum, the derivative is zero by Fermat's theorem too. So I'm just writing the, the word that, that that's treated similarly. All right. So the, the extreme value uh, uh, in, in the interval has to be interior because the endpoints are equal in case two and three. And Fermat's theorem says the derivative will be zero there. Cool. Well, let's do uh, a couple of kind of, or at least one kind of uh, example to show. <clears throat> what we mean by finding the value. So let, let's suppose we have this function, f of x is this quadratic polynomial, minus x squared plus six x minus two. And, and let's show that it satisfies the hypothesis of Rolle's theorem. And then let's find all the values of C that, that satisfy it. Okay, so it's kind of a multi-part example. I wanna show that we satisfy those three hypotheses on this interval from one to five. And then the second part, I wanna find all the values of C that satisfy the conclusion all the, the C's that make the derivative zero. All right, so what are the hypotheses? Well, continuity and differentiability. F is a polynomial. Polynomials are continuous and differentiable on the whole real line. I'm gonna abbreviate here so I don't have to write so much. That symbol uh, R, like that's, that means all real numbers. All real numbers is what I mean by this symbol. So in particular, it's continuous and differentiable on the interval from one to five, right? So what's the third hypothesis? We have to check the endpoints. So we have to compute f of one. Well, f of one is minus one plus six minus two, and that's three. Uh, we also have to compute f of five f of five is minus 25 plus 30 minus two. That's also three, all right? So the hypotheses are satisfied. The hypotheses are satisfied. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion says that the derivative should be zero somewhere. Well, what is the derivative? The derivative of this function by the power and sum and difference rules, it's minus two x plus six, yeah? So how, what, what's the equation that we have to solve? We have to take the derivative minus two x plus six and set it equal to zero. Well, that's a semi-friendly equation. That means that uh, a six is two x or three is x. It has one solution. So the value of c, I'm just calling it c because that's the notation in the statement of the theorem, takes c to be three, all right? Uh, if we do that, then f prime of three is equal to zero. So it turns out there's exactly one value here in this example. Let's switch over to Desmos real quick and check out uh, uh, what, what our work means uh, graphically, okay? So just a real quick switch over here to the Desmos window. I've got that function uh, minus x squared plus six x minus two plotted. It's an upside down parabola. I'm kind of showing you here in the picture uh, uh, that f of one and f of five are both equal to three. Yeah, so that uh, output value at the two endpoints uh, one and five are the same. And sure enough, there's a flat tangent line. You can see it, there's exactly one. And we just calculated that that x value where that happens is, is just like it looks like in the picture, it's x equals three. Okay, so that's what Rolle's theorem is telling us in that particular example. Nice. Switching back here to the whiteboard. 
takes a second, we're back. Here's kind of a cool conversation we can have real quick. Um, what does Rolle's theorem mean if, if f is a position function? Yeah, so f is recording the position of something moving along a line in your favorite uh, units. You know, maybe it's measuring distance in meters and time in seconds, distance in feet, time in hours, knock yourself out, but it's a position function. So what, what, is, what is this interpretation of Rolle's theorem? Well, the fact that f of a, and a and b I'm thinking of as time values now, yeah? So, so A is the sort of start of the time interval, B is the end of the time interval. So, so I like to use words like initial and, and terminal, yeah? So, so what is this saying, that F of A is equal to F of B? Well, it means that the location at the initial time, A, and the terminal time, B, are the same. That the object, the particle, at time A is in the same place that it is later on at time B. So it's returned to where it started, if you like. Um, F prime of C being zero means that the velocity is zero somewhere. Velocity zero means the particle stopped. So Rolle's theorem in this context has a very pleasant interpretation. If you have some object in motion along a line and that object returns to its original position at the end of its journey, then it has to stop at least one instance somewhere in between. The velocity has to be zero at least once in between time equal A and time equal B. Cool. I like that. All right, moving along, let's look at the mean value theorem. I said earlier that Rolle's theorem was a consequence of this. It's a special case of it. So let's look at the mean value theorem hypothesis. It's basically the first two are the exact same. You have to have a continuous function on the closed interval. It has to be differentiable on the open interval. But we're not going to any longer insist that f of a equals f of b. The conclusion of the mean, so there's just two hypotheses. The conclusion of the mean value theorem says that there's some number C that satisfies this equation. F prime of C is equal to this, well, I won't even say it. Well, F of B minus F of A over B minus A. We've seen that thing before. We've seen that thing before. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here so my handwriting can be a little bit neater. But this, this quantity on the right hand side, we called that, well, the secant slope. Uh, or the average rate of change. So the average rate of change in F over the interval from A to B. Average in statistics is sometimes called the mean. So that looks a little fuzzy. If I zoom back out there, it'll look a little bit nicer. So that's how I'm interpreting the right-hand side of that formula is it's the mean change in F, the average rate and change in F over the, over the interval. Uh, uh, we know what F prime is. F prime is the instantaneous rate of change. Yeah. So the mean value theorem is saying that at least once, there's at least one number C between A and B where the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change and hence its name, the mean value theorem. The average change gets assumed once instantaneously. And the last formulation of it, the author is just writing uh, that without a fraction, he multiplied both sides by B minus A, okay? So the mean value theorem says that the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. You can see in these two pictures down here uh, uh, some sort of visual interpretations of that. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, let's look at figure three first. Look at the figure on the left first. Right. What is this average rate of change? It's the secant slope. The secant slope in the picture. That secant slope is exactly equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. It's change in output over change in input. Uh, uh, the mean value theorem is saying that that secant slope has to equal the instantaneous rate of change, the tangent slope, at least at one. I'm pointing at these things and calling them slopes, pointing at the lines, but yeah, that those two lines are parallel, right? They have the same slope, that the tangent line has to be parallel to the secant line at least once. The picture on the right is showing you that it can happen more than once. Yeah, the secant line here is this blue thing that I just highlight in red with the laser pointer. It looks like there's two values of C where the tangent lines are parallel to that secant line. All right, so it can happen more than once. The mean value theorem just says it has to have at least once. 
You can look in your book for a proof of the mean value theorem if you like. It, it basically just does some algebraic manipulation to turn it back into Rolle's theorem. I'm going to skip it uh, and keep this lecture a little bit less uh, theoretical. But if you want to come and talk to me in one of my office hours, I'd be happy to talk to you about that proof of the mean value theorem. But instead of proving it, I'd like to do a, a similar example to what we did with Rolle's theorem and then kind of and focus on its interpretations. Okay, so this time I'm taking a, a cubic polynomial, it's x cubed minus x. I want to show that it satisfies the hypotheses of the mean value theorem on the interval from 0 to 2, and then find all the values of c in between 0 and 2 that satisfy the conclusion. Okay, so same start, f is polynomial. So it's continuous and differentiable on the entire real line. So in particular, on the interval from 0 to 2. Those are the only two hypotheses for the mean value theorem. Uh, but now we need to do some computation, uh, uh, because what I don't have is what the value of the secant slope is. So we need to compute f of 2 minus f of 0 over 2 minus 0. We have to compute the secant slope. OK, well, f of 2 is 8 minus 2, that's 6 f of 0 is 0, 2 minus 0 is, well, 2 minus 0, and so 6 minus 0 over 2 minus 0 is 3. 6 over 2 is 3. So this is our average rate of change, ROC, rate of change. Yeah. So, so the derivative has to equal that value somewhere. OK, well, the derivative, f prime of x, is 3x squared minus 1 by the differentiation rules. So the equation that we have to solve is 3x squared minus 1 is equal to 3. Uh, uh, that would mean that x squared, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of room here, so I'm going to skip a little bit of the algebraic steps. x squared would be 4 thirds. I'm going to go to the right here. So x is equal to, well, either plus or minus 2 over the square root of 3. Yeah, But our interval is the interval from 0 to 2. So we're not going to keep both of those values. We're going to take c equal to 2 over the square root of 3. Then f prime of c is equal to 3. And I've got a little picture down here to show us what we just did. Maybe I can make this picture a little bit bigger. All right, so what are we looking at in the picture? Well, you've got a graph of the function x cubed minus x. It's drawn there uh, in black. And then the secant line, we found these points. The point O in the picture is the point 0, 0. The point B in the picture was the point um, at the right end point. Uh, what was F of 2? It was 6. So that was the point 2, comma 6. So that blue secant line has slope 3. Yeah, And you can see that there's a value of c. This value of c is 2 over the square root of 3. I'll let you get a calculator to uh, uh, calculate its decimal value if you want. But at that value of c, the tangent slope is parallel. Okay, So the mean value theorem says that the instantaneous rate of change has to equal the average rate of change at least once. Nice. Let's interpret this in terms of velocity. Yeah, If, if you have a position function, if f of t is a position function, then, well, this average rate of change, we would call that the average velocity. Yeah, that's kind of how we understand the units. It's the change in position over the change in time. That's average velocity. Yeah. Uh, f prime, we've spoken about this. It's the instantaneous velocity. So the mean value theorem says that your instantaneous velocity cannot, quote unquote, avoid the average. Yeah. You remember back when we spoke about velocity, we took our 210 mile trip in three hours. Yeah, 210 miles in three hours, your average velocity is 70, 70 miles an hour. You weren't going 70 miles an hour the whole time, but the mean value theorem says that you were going 70 miles an hour, exactly 70 miles an hour, at least at some moment. If your average is 70 miles an hour, then at some moment you were going exactly 70 miles an hour. Yeah, maybe I'll try to uh, tease you into coming to talk to me in an office hour and not say this here, but, but uh, this is the basis behind what um, uh, highway patrol or law enforcement officers sometimes refer to as a speed trap. 
uh, it's possible for uh, someone with a, a stopwatch and a known distance to prove that a motorist was uh, violating the speed limit, exceeding the speed limit, without ever actually clocking them on a radar gun. And, and it's based on this, you can calculate the average velocity, and if that average velocity exceeds the speed limit, speed limit then, then your instantaneous velocity was exceeding the, exceeding the speed limit at some moment. All right, so come to, come to an office hour and I'll, I'll chat you up about that. We're gonna be uh, near the end here. There's two very important consequences of the mean value theorem in this section. I, I already kind of talked about them at the outset, but let's, let's just review them here. Um, one of them is the kind of converse to a fact that we know. We know that the derivative of any constant function is zero. Important fact, but the derivative of any constant function is zero. This first theorem, theorem five, is saying that if you have a function whose derivative is always zero, that that function has to be a constant. The only functions whose derivatives are identically zero on intervals are constants. Okay, so that's an important fact. Uh, uh, as a consequence of that, if you have two functions whose derivatives are always the same, then those two functions differ by a constant. That one of them is just the, another one plus a constant. That is their graphs or vertical shifts of each other. All right? So, it's kind of a strange thing to do, but we can prove that corollary. A corollary, by the way, in mathematics is just a, a statement that follows immediately from some theorem. So, so the reason this is being called a corollary is because it's really just a consequence of the theorem, theorem five there. Because in particular, if you take two functions whose derivatives are identically zero, well, and we look at the derivative of their difference, right? Our power rule says that that's the difference of the derivatives, but if f and g have the same derivatives, that difference is zero, right? So theorem five says that if you take a function, here the function I'm talking about is f minus g. If its derivative is identically zero, then it's a constant. And if f minus g is a constant, you just add g to both sides, you can see that f is g plus that constant. Okay, so that's why the corollary works. Let's switch over to Desmos here real quick. I just kind of want to show you uh, uh, visually what you can, how, one way you can kind of interpret that. My tongue trips up when I'm trying to talk. So here you're looking at two functions. Maybe you even recognize what they are, but uh, I'm not, or what the red one is anyway, but I'm, it's not my business here right now. Uh, I'm just showing you I, this blue one, I've got it set up to be the red one plus a constant. And I can change the value of the constant. Like right now, the value of the constant is, uh, it's trying to fight me, it's about two. 2.01 anyway, yeah? So where I land on the y-axis is the value of the constant. And you can see in this picture that those two functions have the same derivatives everywhere, yeah? That the tangent slope to the blue curve at the corresponding x value is always parallel to the tangent slope of the red curve. That's a consequence of our, of our rule before, that if you take the a derivative of a constant to zero. But this fact that we just saw says that if two functions have the same derivative, so if you took any other function whose derivative was the same as this red one, it has the same slopes, well, then it basically has to be the red one. Yeah, because the derivative, you can't change the, the direction of the curve anywhere. The tangent slopes have to be the same. So what could you do? You could slide it up and down. That's basically all you can do. If you're not allowed to change the tangent slopes anywhere, you can just vertically shift it. So that's basically what this corollary that we proved just said, that we just proved says. Okay, so we're almost done. Let's switch back to the whiteboard. I wanna just give you a teeny inkling of, of why this theorem five is true, okay? So I've, I've got a picture down here and I've got the theorem statement again so we, we don't have to keep scrolling. So, so why, if, if a function's derivative is identically zero, would the function have to be a constant? Okay, why would that have to be true? This is a common technique of proof in mathematics. I'm gonna prove this by so-called contradiction. Suppose that f isn't constant, yeah? So what does it mean if a function isn't constant? Well, then uh, it must have two different output values. If your function is not a constant, uh, here, uh, sorry, I, I was a little bit sloppy here because these a and b's are not the same. Uh, uh, let me fix this like this. Let me change this A and B down here to say capitals. 
sorry about that, but I wasn't paying attention when I prepped this. But but the A and B in my in my little proof here might not be the same. So so let me just switch those down there to capitals. So if your function isn't a constant on the interval capital A to capital B, well then there must be some values little a and little b in that interval that have different outputs, right? And if those outputs are different, then the average rate of change between those two numbers is, this, is not going to be zero. Here I've got it drawn in my picture over here is my little a and little b. If the f of a is not the same as f of b, then that secant slope between them is not zero. That average rate of change, secant slope, it all means the same thing. It's not zero. Yeah, but the mean value theorem says that somewhere in between a little a and little b, the derivative is going to be zero. All right, but but we were saying in the hypothesis of this that 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 never is true. So so logically, what I've just proven is that if f isn't constant on the interval capital A to capital B, then the derivative would have to be non-zero somewhere. So that's logically equivalent to saying if the derivative is zero everywhere, the function has to be a constant. Okay, so that wraps us up for this section. I hope you make it through the activities and the uh, uh, homework. And uh, you'll see how this mean value theorem will creep up. It'll creep up for us uh, again next time in section 4.3 when we're trying to determine where functions are increasing and decreasing. So thanks for listening.